I'm Nick Thomas Simmons, the Member of Parliament for Torvine and the Chair of the Aniram Bevan Society. It's great to welcome you for the latest of my interviews with former leaders of the Labour Party on the occasion of the 70th anniversary of the creation of the National Health Service. It's my pleasure to welcome today Lord Kinnock, who was the leader of the Labour Party between 1983 and 1992. Lord Kinnock, Neil, great to have you here today. Thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure, great pleasure. And Neil, I'm going to start with Tradiga because like Nye Bevan, the architect of our National Health Service, uh, you're from uh, Tradiga. How do you now reflect on the influence of Tradiga on Nye's life and achievements? Tradiga had huge significance because it provided Nye Bevan with a working model for the design and development of the health service. Uh, around the turn of the century, in Tradiga and a lot of other industrial communities, uh, medical aid societies were established, which depended on universal small contributions from every worker, and uh, with the accumulated resources, made it possible to fund treatment and travel to treatment on a scale previously unknown. And the principles that had been honed over 40 years in the Tradiga Medical Aid Society, in which I had been active as a committee member, uh, were the ones that he eventually installed as statute, as the law of the land, uh, and on which he was able to introduce and operate the National Health Service. Now, what part do you think Nye played in that very different attitude, that very different modern day attitude that we have to healthcare in this country compared to the one that we see across the Atlantic? Nye took these arguments on straight. Uh, first of all, he made the argument, which I entirely agree with, obviously, that it was impossible to fully exercise individual freedom unless there was a fundamental liberty, a body of rights that gave you access to the freedom. And he thought it was perverse, therefore, to make the argument that the freedom to pay, which is the freedom being argued for in the USA and in parts of the British political body, the freedom to pay was the same thing as freedom of access, freedom of care, freedom from pain, uh, freedom from neglect. And so he, at the outset, completely discarded the idea that what he was seeking to do was to introduce a better system dependent on the freedom to pay. And he argued that at no time should health ever be considered to be any form of commodity for supply in a market governed by the laws of supply, demand, and price. And so that's why we've got the health service that we've got. And while all these years later, the United States of America, a sophisticated democracy, is still divided between those who can afford healthcare at different levels and those who are still, despite Obamacare, desperately neglected and who live in fear of falling ill. And the mistake that people I greatly admire in the American political system, stretching back to Franklin Roosevelt and coming right through to Barack Obama and including Lyndon Baines Johnson, who was a great progressive in this respect, and Bill Clinton looking at them all, a huge mistake that they've made. Uh, and I used to argue this with Teddy Kennedy, who happened to agree with me, uh, was not to argue for small s socialized health provision. And by that means to occupy the territory in people's minds that produced a huge majority understanding that health was not something that could or should be bought and sold, but provided as of right, and then concentrate on the various ethical 
and economic questions that arise from that afterwards. Uh, Teddy took that view and, of course, several times it introduced bills in, uh, in the Senate to try to secure socialized health care. He was battered politically because of it, but he sustained the argument with great courage. The nearest they've come to it is Obamacare. And as we've seen, that tragically has got huge shortcomings and is liable to the disruption of uh, zany ideologues like Trump. The Conservative Party, of course, voted against the second NHS reading. at second reading. <laughs> uh, but when they came back to power in 1951, it was on a basis of a promise that they had to protect yeah. the National Health Service. And we'll come in a moment to some later Conservative Party policies with the NHS, but on that 1951 election, isn't it a, the strength of Bevan's achievement that the opposition had to promise that, or thought they had to promise that, to regain power? It was a huge advance. Uh, because the Conservative Party and Winston Churchill and younger Conservatives who had been through the war and whose political attitudes had been affected by what they'd witnessed during the Depression before the war embraced the NHS having voted against the bill at the second reading. They didn't vote against it at third reading, of no. course, because their attitudes by then had started to change, and they could see how overwhelmingly popular uh, the National Health Service was, and that the consensus across the country insisted on the maintenance of the principles and practice of the NHS. So there was no promise to diminish uh, or destroy the NHS in the 1950 and 1951 general elections. And when they came into power, sure enough, they sustained the trajectory of funding for the National Health Service at about 4% addition every year, to their credit. And that's a demonstration in itself of the way in which a progressive idea, an enlightened idea, put into practical effect, demonstrating uh, that it extended in its benefit to everyone on the basis of collection from everyone uh, provides a model which even opponents dare not dismantle. And the mistake subsequently, in some cases, of various improvements and progressive policies introduced by Labour through our periods in office, has been to fail to implement the policy and then advocate the policy, really become missionary about the policy, so that the general public understood, first of all, it was an act of deliberate application of political conscience, of conviction. Secondly, that uh, these improvements and advances didn't drop out of the sky they were the result of effective, active democracy. And thirdly, that people therefore had a strong individual vested interest for themselves, their families, their communities in maintaining that progress. Now, if uh, other improvements had been asserted as ferociously and with the breadth that Nye and Clematley and other labor figures of the 1940s showed in establishing the National Health Service, then I think that uh, it would have been po uh, more possible to consolidate advances made and uh, not to have seen them either diminished by funding withdrawals uh, or other means of reducing and diluting the effectiveness of progressive policies. So. The NHS and I provide examples, um, if you like, role models for what a progressive democratic socialist government should do to ensure that uh, the uh, progress that it makes endures 
rather than becomes liable to the fickle political fate. In your period as party leader between 1983 and 1992, the Thatcher uh, reforms extended into the NHS, yes. into the forms of the internal market. How do you reflect back now on those 1980s changes and the approach that Labour took? When uh, Mrs Thatcher's government started to introduce this fragmentation of the health service, the so-called purchaser provider division and the so-called internal market. And we did everything that we could within the law to resist those changes. And we won the argument, largely because of the absolutely superior talents of the person who was our shadow health secretary for most of that period, my appointment, Robin Cook, who was utterly brilliant and energetically committed and he would face Tory health secretary after Tory health secretary and beat them down in the arguments but of course Mrs Thatcher had the votes and she also <clears throat> appeared to be winning a public argument about efficiency in the health service which was the uh, excuse used for the introduction of a market system in the NHS. And secondly, uh, she employed the arguments of, quote, quote, freedom, uh, which ensured, uh, on her word for it, the health service was safe in their hands. That was the term she used. Uh, for the great mass of people and the great majority of needs, but that the position of the private sector must be safeguarded in the name of the exercise of individual choice. Now, superficially, uh, it's difficult to make an argument against those individual points. But of course, combine them, put them together, and what you get is a health service divided, as I put it, divided by the salt. The moment that uh, pricing mechanisms that determine the allocation of resources um, and decisions about recruitment and appointment and promotion and organization and the uh, allocation of hospital and therapy resources. The moment that that uh, is put into a commercial nexus, then the principles change. And what we saw is two things, the weakening of the central theme of the health service and the resentment of the medical professions, because they could see uh, how these arguments were being used as a mask for the alteration of the main principle, the main thrust of health services. So we had lots of support from medical practitioners of every kind, and the nursing profession, of course. Um, but given the size of Mrs. Thatcher's majority, with a few uh, courageous Tory individuals breaking ranks, very few of them, then uh, we saw the health service going through those years of totally unnecessary and very, very expensive turmoil. Because the other consequence of uh, introducing commercial principles, market principles, demand and supply mm. and price principles into the health service as guiding determinants is to ensure that you need much more administration and checking uh, on the integrity of the system and you run up huge management bills that if you have a free health service that is substantially run by practitioners, uh, assisted by expert administrators, it's an expense you don't have to engage in. Another of the changes of the Blair years was, of course, devolution. And the position that you faced in the late 1980s was that those Thatcher changes were obviously affecting our native Wales yeah. uh, as well as England. 
Today, however, that is different. And given that Nye uh, wasn't a great fan of devolution, of course, is it perhaps a, an irony that the model that he envisaged of the NHS with fewer of these uh, market reforms and competition uh, is actually now the case uh, in Wales than it is across the border in England? Well, Nye nice said that um, uh, democratic socialism is the conviction that free people using free institution can resolve the challenges of yeah. the age. And what's been interesting in Wales in trying to restore the government very, try very deliberately seeking to restore basic principles of organization and provision does mean that it is closer to the way in which Nye and many others wanted the health service to develop. The fundamental flaw, of course, is not of the government's making, and it is that the devolved administrations are dependent on the block grant. Uh, the formulation of that grant is outdated, as just about everybody acknowledges, and the cuts in the total amount of money available to Wales a relatively low-income country, in any case, mean that they have an effect, the overall cuts have an effect on standards of provision in Wales, so that there are areas in which there is genuine and justifiable concern about the quality and immediacy of treatment. But that doesn't make the principle of organisation wrong, it simply means that Wales hasn't got the access to sufficient uh, funding resources. And hopefully that can be changed over the time ahead. Indeed, vitally, it must be changed uh, in order to ensure that you haven't just got a well-run service, but you've got a service that is well-funded. Finally, uh, Neil, I hope you don't mind me saying so, but I think you were born in 1942. That's right. So you would have been six when the National Health Service came into being. Uh, is it an issue that the National Health Service, even for your generation, is now moving, to the, its creation is moving to the very edge of living memory? We don't have that many people left who can really remember what the National Health uh, Service uh, has actually done in terms of the difference it made in 1948. Uh, how does that affect the 70th anniversary in terms of needing to continue to make the case for the National Health Service, first of all. And secondly, how do you think the next 70 years will be? A great friend of Nye Babin's, Pierre Mondes France, the leader of the French Socialists, said that democratic socialism is like a bicycle. It must go forward or it falls over. And so the 70th anniversary provides us with yet another opportunity, a challenge, to take into account the massive advances made uh, in technology and treatments over the 70 years, the huge change in the demography of advanced societies, like the United Kingdom, and the opportunities and needs that result from the aging of societies, and to try and develop uh, operation of the health service and provision of the health service on the basis of the same principles of universality and free access, but sophisticating those to meet the needs of the age. Now, obviously, funding is absolutely fundamental to ensuring the quality, the integrity, the efficiency of the National of Health Service. And therefore, I've argued since 1985, with the support <laughs> of, uh, of Robin Cook and others, for the hypothecation of tax for the National Health and Community Care Services. Because that second vital consideration in the maintenance of a free 
high quality health service, uh, which is a health service and not just an illness, illness treatment service, uh, that must be taken into account. Now, I believe that if we reduced the so-called standard rate of income tax, replaced it with a slightly higher rate uh, of funding and made it clear to every taxpayer that the money that they were contributing in that part of their taxation would wholly and solely go to the health and community care services and it would be illegal to spend that money on anything else would mean that people would for the first time ever discover an income tax they were willing and quite happy to pay. Uh, and I believe that unless and until we move to that specified, definitive, exclusively allocated tax, we will continue to be in a situation where even governments of goodwill have difficulty in maintaining the continuing upward expenditure on the National Health Service, which is vital, and less well-disposed governments, like the one we've been experiencing recently, will actually reduce that trajectory. And we will get effectively real terms cuts in the year-on-year -year expenditure of the National Health Service, which obviously has tragic and really destructive effects not only on the provision of healthcare services, but on the, on the moral impulse that ensures that Britain retains uh, the highest achievable quality of universal health services for everyone free at the point of need. And the integrity of that funding is vital to resolving that. There are other changes necessary, uh, one of them being that if we could actually say hand on heart that there was an adequacy of funding for the National Health Service, um, not even a sufficiency yeah. because the needs are infinite, but an adequacy of funding, the demands then that could be imposed on those who operate the service of efficiency, of value per unit of expenditure would be absolutely implacable. But you can't get uh, the highest standards of efficiency with a deficiency of resources. So the adequacy of funding, the buoyancy of funding, year after year, decade after decade, addressing the changing realities of health availability and health needs, they are the questions that we must be focusing on to ensure that the health service continues to be the emancipating blessing that it has been and should be throughout all time. Neil Kinnock, thank you very much.